If religion's political influence were confined to civil war and terrorism, it might well confirm at least part of the secularization thesis. I have in mind the claim of the neo-atheists like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens that where religion persists, it is violent and irrational. But part of the great surprise of religion's resurgence is that it has been a forceful instrument also of tearing down dictatorships, promoting democracy, mediating peace, and healing the wounds of war and dictatorship, quite the opposite of violence. We also found that religious actors have become a force for democracy and peace when they possess the mirror opposite characteristics of religious actors who foment violence, namely independence from the state and a political theology that itself prescribes democracy, peace, and reconciliation as expressions of religious belief. Consider democracy. In 78 cases of democratization since 1972, religion has contributed strongly in 48, that's 48 out of 78 cases, we find. If you're old enough, you will remember Pope John Paul II's pilgrimages to communist Poland beginning in 1979, where he preached to hundreds of thousands. But not just any old homily. Rather, in terms that were unmistakable to Poles, he challenged the legitimacy of the regime. Or recall the Protestants who gathered in the Nikolai Kirsha in Leipzig in November 1989, or the Muslim leaders in Indonesia who helped to bring down Suharto in 1998. This was not supposed to happen, according to the secularization thesis. Democracy, with its open debate and its popular control, was supposed to have exposed religion as a crutch for primitive people. Surprisingly, though, religion has profited from precisely the open debate and room to operate that democracy affords. The best squelchers of religion are, in fact, secular dictators. Religious actors are not always the supporters of democracy, though. The Catholic Church in Rwanda was acquiescent and even somewhat participatory in the genocide of 1994. What distinguishes the democratizers from the supporters of authoritarianism? The most forceful democratizers have been those religious actors who, often through determined resistance, preserved a measure of independence from the state. An example is the major Islamic movements under Suharto, the dictator who held power from 1965 to 1998 in Indonesia. Where religious actors remain cozy with the state, they had little incentive to support democracy. Examples include the Argentine Catholic Church in the late 1970s and the Buddhist Sangha in Sri Lanka. In other cases, religious actors become so suppressed by the state that they simply lack power to act independently. The Orthodox churches in the Soviet Union and communist Eastern Europe are illustrative. We also found that religious actors who agitate for democracy are ones whose doctrines involve a political theology that supports democracy and human rights through its very propositions. A striking trend was what the late political scientist Samuel Huntington, whom we dedicate our book to, I should, should add, called the Catholic wave, the preponderant role of the Catholic Church in the third wave of democratization. That's from 1972 to the present. National Catholic Churches, in fact, constituted 36 out of the 48 cases of religious democratizers. What motored this trend, we argue, was an important shift in political theology, namely a full embrace of religious freedom and other human rights by the Church at the Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 1965. As for Islam, we find that democracy is still relatively rare. Only three out of 47 countries are ranked, Muslim-majority countries, are ranked free by Freedom House. Still, Islam has had strong democratizers in places like Turkey and Indonesia, movements with independence from the state, and a democratic political theology. It is these that hold promise for the future.